Scum. My name is Maria and I'm the programme manager for the National Healthcare Science Programme that sits within Health Education and Improvement Wales. So thank you for joining our Healthcare Science Programme Spotlight session on the NHS Wales COVID-19 Innovation and Transformation Study. So just before we go in to the exciting presentations that we have lined up for you today, please can I ask you all to switch off your cameras and move to your microphones. We will be monitoring the chat for questions from guests. However, as this is a one hour session, we're not going to answer the questions during this session. We'll pick them up post and um, email, either email you directly or we set up some function that we can email you as a collective to all delegates. So without further ado, I'm going to kick off by introducing Robert Salter and he's going to be presenting Oop, it's just popped off my screen. I was relying on that agenda. Um, he's going to be presenting using RFID tracking to manage medical devices and increase staff safety during the COVID-19 pandemic. So over to you, Rob. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm an innovation scientist here at Cumtath uh, University Health Board. Um, but I'm going to be talking about a piece of work that we were doing when I was previously in the clinical engineering department. Uh, so the, the, the simple question is, um, can medical devices pose a risk to both patients and staff? And the answer is, if they're not cleaned properly, then yes. Um, but, but cleaning a piece of equipment so it's safe to use on a ward is one thing, but having a piece of equipment clean and safe to be stripped down and serviced in a lab is a completely different um, problem. We, we know through AGP, um, procedures that contaminants can get inside equipment um, as well as beyond outside of the surface. So th there's more risk um, to clinical engineers when they're servicing equipment that's been in COVID areas than just from um, expo exposure. Right. So at, at Cubtaf University, we have a, an RFID tracking system by Concepto. Um, and I'm not going to talk much about how um, RFID can track equipment around the hospital because I, you know, most people understand that now. Um, what I want to talk about is the value of the data that it generates. Um, and RFID systems generate huge amounts of auditable data and, and tr uh, trails of where everything has been. And this is what we saw as the value um, for equipment and how to keep people safe. So our system at, at Stands, um, we've spent over 300,000 in investment. That's the 200,000 in capital and revenue expenditure. Um, we've earned about 100K of um, scientist uh, time in developing the system. We have eight handheld mobile readers that go around the wards. Um, we have 23 ceiling mounted readers, which is only covering approximately 5% of the hospital estate. Um, so there's a large investment required to, to increase the amount of ceiling automated readers. We're currently running about 7,000 tags uh, deployed across beds, medical equipment, wheelchairs, O2 cylinders, uh, infusion pumps, things. So we use a piece of software called K-Track by Concepto, um, which provides a user-based um, map uh, on the screen of the hospitals. Um, and on the map, it shows you the uh, inventories available on each ward. We also use a web-based in-house developed equipment library uh, software that allows users to, to research the um, tracking software for the location of any piece of equipment. And in the background then we have API services that uh, provide location updates into our asset management systems. So this is an example of uh, what the, the user would see if they were on the map. And what we what we decided with when um, COVID-19 hit, hit the hospitals and we were all going for the procedures of having red wards, green wards, amber wards, is that we could actually utilize the map on this tracking system to actually give a visual identification of red, amber and green uh, to any staff so we know what equipment's in what colour zone. Um, this also allows us to bring audit history in so we can actually see what equipment's been in red zones, what equipment's only been in green zones and, and uh, allow for how much can, uh, decontamination is required of the equipment. So 
was it worth it? The, the, it's the real big question is we spent all this money on RFID tracking and we modified it with, with, with you know, a, a, a few days work to um, support tracking COVID-19 infections uh, around the hospital. And the, the first sort of point that I'd say is, was it worth it, um, is, well, in, in the Royal De Morgan Hospital, none of our engineers caught COVID. Um, so that's got to be a success. Um, so we're all scientists and we want the empirical evidence. So we, we can't leave it there. We've got to ask ourselves, can we prove if it was RFID that actually prevented our engineers from catching COVID? So we got to look at the data. Um, and so analyzing the data from our systems and, and uh, to start where we did it the old fashioned way with Excel spreadsheets. Um, and the results weren't um, as what we expected. So we have we, we the data shows that the, the actual RFID tracking system is only actually getting about 10 visits a month from staff members. In the whole space of one year's worth of tracking, it was 402 items searched for. Um, these numbers are exceptionally lower than what we was expecting. Um, we're having approximately um, 1,000 automatic updates daily. Uh, so and when the, the uh, system detects a piece of equipment moving from one zone to another zone, it automatically updates uh, our asset management systems in the background. Um, we are having approximately 500 pieces of equipment identified a day as moving in uh, COVID zones. And that approximated to 50 pieces of equipment a day changing from um, a red to a green or green to red status. Um, and our users um, were averaging um, 6.5 zone changes a month. So within a month, um, we, we'd average just between somewhere between six and seven wards would change status from a red to a green or green to red or to amber. So these numbers were quite shocking um, and they really made us question what the ROI is on the, on the system. So for £300,000 worth of capital and revenue expenditure, you know, it's worked out that, that each individual search has cost the health board £746. Um, now, when we buy these systems, we're buying them on the, 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 um, the premise that we're going to save nurses time by searching for equipment. They don't have to um, size. So the, the, the industry sort of norm that they use is that an RFID system will on average um, save 30 minutes per day per nurse um, by having the nurse use the system um, to search for equipment. But this is contradictory to what we found because we only found 402 searches in a space of a year. Um, so how do we get 30 minutes per day per nurse? Um, and the, the verdict of the, of, the, of the system is that you don't. Um, that when you're using an, an RFID system such as what we got for purely asset management, you will not make an ROI. The return on investment um, for purely asset management is not enough. Uh, which is quite sad, really, but but it shows why the adoption throughout the UK has been very poor in RFID systems. Um, staff are just not engaged in the task of electronically searching for assets. Um, in other words, staff do not have time to go and find a computer to go and look to see where the equipment is. And uh, they rely on the old fashioned methods of when was the last time you saw it? Is there anybody locally you can ask who might know where one is? Um, and what we didn't factor in is that there are different types of search and RFID only supports certain types of search. And, and the, um, the premise of buying an RFID system is it's going to support you on your searches, all searches, and that's not true. Uh, it's only supporting certain types of search, which is el electronic um, asset. And so RFID is, in, in all the purposes, an audit and a process tool for electronic searching and, and uh, analysis of data. It's not a real, uh, real time practical tool for nurses to use. Um, front. So this is quite surprising. So, you know, what we're, we're saying is that we were COVID free in our department and we had a really good audit and ability to know where our equipment had been, um, but we didn't use the system. 
So one of the things we did with the system is we looked at how AI could support all this data that we have. And if, if you look at using the IBM AI ladder, which is what we use for with IBM Watson, we were, we were bordering around the data into information stage, um, which was not enough to, to return the investment. We needed to move into the knowledge. And, uh, and that's just basically to scale the insights that the AI is bringing us to other places. It's, it's analyzing it so we can infuse it into existing hospital systems. So we developed uh, machine learning with our equipment library management system to analyze the movement of equipment within the a &E department. So analyzing um, if infusion pumps were moving in certain patterns, if trolleys were moving in certain patterns, if the wheelchairs were moving in, uh, from one place to another place. And we also to spot when equipment would le was leaving the, the um, department and mm -hmm. how much equipment was in use at any particular one time. This gave us a, an idea of the busyness and the uh, categorization of patients within e the ED. And the ED is the biggest source of equipment movements within a hospital. So if you if you understand your, your movement within ED, you understand your movement within the hospital. Um, so utilizing this uh, information, we were able to automatically book equipment into the ED department for, for our porter and restocking systems so that we could make sure that ED stayed uh, full of equipment and, um, and that, that we were meeting the, the needs of the department. That was a simple ask, and it was just a, bit of, uh, a little bit of um, simple pattern matching uh, and then tagging it to our library booking system to generate the, the jobs. So the next steps for us with, with, with our idea thing is we need, we're starting to look now at deep learning to understand the, um, the movement of the data, and we're letting the, um, the machine learning uh, work in what they call an unsupervised manner so that it tells us the insights. Um, so then we can train uh, the platform to look for patterns in the data that can help with planning. So we've already done um, some pattern matching with our portering department to look at um, movements of, of a, um, wheelchairs, beds, trolleys um, around the uh, around the hospital and at so what times of the day um, are, we, are we moving the most equipment? Um, and see in the graphs below, we we can see that um, wheelchair movements in that this is this is um, tracking movements of patients that are currently um, sitting in the accident emergency department and are going to go to radiology for a uh, scan, uh, and, uh, in this case, an X-ray, um, as part of their treatment within A and E. And what we can see is that the specific um, mapping of the times that those patients were moving in, into radiology. Um, and then we can also see with our bed movements on, over on the right hand side that the majority of our beds and, and management were moving around the hospital on a Saturday, uh, which is quite important for us because we didn't actually have beds management teams on site on a Saturday. Yet Saturdays were the busiest day of the week for moving beds. So we, that's enabled us to actually look at our planning and to consider, you know, do we need to look at how the rotors are, are, are factored um, to make sure that our beds um, and equipment teams are available on the right days, at the right times to support these people. So this is where what we. Uh, So we, um, for us, what we consider to be is moving up the ladder of wis to wisdom. So we want to, if I should shoot back, we need to go from the information stage, which we we are not going to return on uh, investment, to to the uh, the wisdom stage, which is um, providing insightful knowledge to our clinicians on what actually is happening in the hospital. And, um, and it is done without any user intervention. So the, the computer itself is working all this information out and presenting it to people to aid in planning and stuff. And that's where we see that we'll be getting our return of investment on our RFID tracking system. Because as I said earlier on, if you're just thinking RFID is going to be enough for tracking and inventory management, it's not. You're not going to get enough use out of it. And the, um, per search and per update, um, if you look at the, number of the, the actual small amount of equipment that's moving around a hospital at any one time, it's not enough to, to warrant the system. Um, so we, we look at a, a typical hospital having about 10,000 pieces of equipment. 
you might only have about 800 of those 10,000 actually on it moving on a daily basis, uh, and that's not enough to generate the uh, return of interest. Is there any questions? Thank you so much, Absolutely. Rob. It's really, really interesting, you know, to see that presentation because I think as part of the project group um, that was obviously part and parcel of commissioning Swansea Uni and obtaining all these fantastic case studies, it's really brought that case study to life and given it the insight that is needed. And I think those next steps are so important. And, you know, ultimately, during a crisis, people do often do new and innovative things that have never been done before. And I think yes. that we look at issues differently and we take that instinctive action that challenges the status quo. So, you know, that's just really highlighted that, you know, we can break down barriers and we can accelerate that change in how services are delivered. So that was a fantastic presentation. And we've had um, John in the chat bar saying thank you. Very interesting. Yes. So, uh, yes. Yeah. I, I, I think I got across that um, that you know we can we can use COVID to test preconceptions on um, things. So we always we always thought that we had a value for money system, um, but when we actually uh, stress tested it with COVID and actually um, wanted some evidence from the system, we actually then started questioning what the value really was. And then, and then that, that give us the direction then to find out where we've got to look to get that value. Yeah, you know, it's great. And, you know, we've seen that people want to maintain that progress that we've seen in the system. And I'm, you know, I'm particularly pleased to see these examples of how our colleagues have adapted existing services, you know, to protect those vulnerable patients, whilst also ensuring that treatment for urgent conditions could continue. So, you know, that's a fantastic presentation. And thank you so much for that. Thank so, you. Yes, so we will be popping into the chat as well throughout this session a link to the innovation study and um, we'll also put the link into the case studies that were collected as well throughout um, the project group to support some of these. So yes, thank you. So without further ado, um, we're going to play um, for you Professor Chris Hopkins, who is the consultant clinical scientist and head of clinical engineering at Howell Gar UHB. So his presentation is on generating innovation and research opportunities during COVID-19. So I'm going to hope this works when Sam and Sam plays. Good afternoon, I'm Professor Chris Hopkins, Head and Scientific Lead of the Tritech Institute down in Hawaldar. It's been a really difficult 18 months for us all, but one of the things we've learned from the pandemic is that science and technology has an enormous part to play in healthcare across the globe, more importantly to us for our patients, our clinical teams and our communities. Truly innovative health technologies offer us the potential to have a powerful positive impact upon our patients, health system and staff, thereby transforming healthcare for the future. And the new Tritech Institute within Howell Bar has been established to nurture and support such developments. Through the development, testing and adoption of new technologies at scale across our community and across Wales. Through building genuine trust between the NHS, academia and the commercial sector about what can be achieved through working closely together. And through creating a supportive environment for technology companies in Wales in which incentives and structures are aligned to support innovation and patient safety underpinned by a regulatory environment that supports this moving forwards. One of the most significant challenges during the pandemic was maintaining research activity, given the pressures on the system associated with COVID-19. Positively, it has led to far more clinicians wishing to be involved, involved in studies that enable their patients to be offered treatments only available through participation in a research trial. This has also been supported and encouraged as innovation and research and development have become core business and key pillars of the UK government and Welsh government response to the pandemic. Negatively, it has meant that it has not been possible to undertake as many non-COVID studies. And while some studies are starting to restart, 
this is a challenge that we anticipate will remain for some time yet. As part of developing the new R&D strategic plan, we've been identifying new areas that can help maintain and develop our level of research activity, whilst maximizing the benefits delivered to the UHB patients and citizens. Through supporting local businesses with new technology developments, we have also discovered how we can assist the, the local circular economy by making the conduct of trials within the NHS more efficient than had previously been the case. One positive development from the trials supported during the COVID-19 period has been a much strengthened relationship between the research and development department and the clinical engineering departments. Companies seeking to develop new technologies needed to get rapid regulatory approval from the MHRA through the exceptional use of non-CE marked medical devices procedures. Achieving such approval required the expert technical input of clinical engineers and scientists within the clinical engineering department, alongside the input of experienced researchers, adept at designing studies and gaining ethical approval. Simply put, we found that our local supply chain cannot interface with the NHS without clinical engineering and, and R&D support. And some examples of the work already undertaken during the pandemic are, we led the clinical and scientific development of a variant on a CPAP um, device for the local engineering company. We provided consultancy services for all Wales on the development of respiratory equipment, working with business Wales who provide free independent advice to people starting, running and growing a business in Wales. Working with the local university on the production and supply of oxygen saturation monitors and providing a quality assurance service to develop PPE equipment. Both R&D and clinical engineering considered there to be significant merit in continuing this joint working through the establishment of a joint function that optimizes the supply of new, novel, effective and safe technologies benefiting staff and patients, that increases the number and quality of new technology and device research trials underpinned by value-based healthcare, and one which nurtures the local supply chain for wider economic and health-related gain. The preferred option saw the creation of an in-house team of engineers, scientists, clinicians, and researchers with a common goal of translating innovative medical technologies into patient benefit. The team spans clinical engineering and R&D, providing a multidisciplinary cross-sector team, combining capabilities in engineering, technology, and innovation with strong links to higher educational institutes. The senior leadership team can be seen on the slide who supported the creation of a single point of access for local manufacturers to the health board, supporting the development of health technologies that result in health gains whilst contributing to regional wealth. A capability to compete with other new device and technology research centers to secure pre prestigious grants and enable an efficient response to external companies looking to see market products in advance of commercialization. An internal consultancy service able to identify areas where the UHB could optimize its practices through embracing new technologies, including a credible team able to work with clinical staff to develop concepts and translate late these into innovative medical technologies and processes to benefit patients, staff, and the wider health economy. A team with the skills and technical experience to manage the end-to-end -end innovation pathway, from identifying needs and solutions through to design, prototyping, clinical testing, as well as IP advice and implementation, working with university partners, pooling knowledge, expertise, and resources. The TriTech Institute is an innovation led by Howard R University Health Board and partnered with the Accelerate Healthcare Technology Centre in Swansea University and the Assistive Technologies Innovation Centre in the University of Wales, Trinity and St. David. TriTech brings together a number of regional partnerships to support the development of healthcare solutions on a local, national and global level, offering designers and manufacturers a single point of access to the NHS through a collaborative and agile approach. We offer services to support research, real-world evaluation, value-based healthcare, regulatory advice, and clinical expertise. And the team are already working on over 15 innovative projects with academics and commercial partners, which will have a positive impact upon our patients across Howell Dar. 
whilst a number of the projects we are currently working on contain non-disclosure agreements. I just wanted to share some specific examples of the work the team are currently undertaking. Tritech provide three main offerings, core research, real-world evaluation, and consultancy. Under research, Tritech is currently collaborating with academia and industry partners to carry out research on a new artificial intelligence platform with pe for people living with cancer. The platform includes an innovative design to implement novel techniques to interpret MRI imaging, preparing and providing resources to enable clinicians to better diagnose cancer. The research, research will allow us to apply prudent healthcare principles in the delivery of care pathways within the whole of our region and beyond. Evaluation, Tritech is currently evaluating the use of technology-enabled care in the remote monitoring of patients with chronic conditions such as COPD. This mixed method evaluation aims to determine the perceived and actual benefits of a remote patient monitoring in a real-world environment. And under consultancy, we were recently commissioned to prepare a step-by-step -step report on a medical device prototype for a local company. The report provides information and template documents that are aimed to help develop the evidence case before submission to the MHRA prior to clinical investigation. The guidance and recommendations in this report were based on the latest regulations provided under EU MDR 2017-745 and more appropriately within the UK, UK MDR 2002. Many thanks for listening all, and please feel free to get in touch via the links on the slide. I'm not sure whether Maria is having trouble with her connection at the moment, so I'll just step in to say thank you for that fantastic presentation. Um, I believe that we have um, someone else on the line regarding the uh, next presentation. And um, again, it's a, I believe that it's a recorded one. Sam, if you can confirm that. Yeah, so the next presentation is recorded by um, Ali Hughes and Hannah Jones in Betsy. Cadwalder Health Board um, around um, cardiac physiology. Fantastic. So Sam will, will cue that one up and get that one ready to play. Um, and then we'll come back after the next the presentation. Next presentation too. Hello, my name is Alan Hughes and I'm a cardiac physiologist working at Splitter Grinnell in Bangor. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you on behalf of the Betsy Cadwalder University Health Board and in collaboration with Medtronic, Triage HF Plus, a remote monitoring method of risk scoring patients for heart failure decompensation. Heart failure is a complex clinical syndrome where the heart does not pump blood around the body as effectively as it should. There may also be a change in the heart structure where the heart becomes dilated. The main symptoms include breathlessness, fatigue, and swelling as a result of fluid retention. Heart failure usually presents gradually over time, but signs and symptoms can appear suddenly with patients often experiencing several acute episodes leading to unplanned emergency hospital admissions and further deterioration of their health. While there is currently no cure for heart failure, there are several proven treatments that can allow many patients to live well for longer. One common treatment is the use of a cardiac implantable electronic device, specifically a cardiac resynchronization therapy device or a biventricular pacemaker. Heart failure poses a recognized burden on healthcare system in the UK, resulting in approximately 2% of the overall NHS budget, with approximately 70% of this due to hospitalization costs. Figures also suggest that approximately 5% of all emergency admissions are due to heart failure, and that this is the most common reason for admission in patients over 65 years of age. These admissions account for approximately 1 million patient bed days per year, and given that the average cost of a hospital admission in the UK is almost 3,800, 
the strain of heart failure admission costs on the NHS becomes apparent and it's clear to see why it's recognised as a national priority. Despite optimal treatment, rehospitalisation rates in heart failure patients are also very high. And unfortunately, there is a link between increased patients, rehospitalisation and mortality. In fact, it's been reported that approximately 50% of patients over the age of 75 years of age will die within one year following three hospital admissions for heart failure symptoms. Heart failure also puts a significant burden on the population of Wales. Back in 2017, the Welsh Government noted that approximately 32,500 people in Wales suffer with heart failure. In addition, approximately 350 people in Wales are admitted each month due to heart failure as their primary diagnosis, with hundreds more being admitted with heart failure as part of the diagnosis. The British Heart Foundation Cymru warns that the figures highlight the significant challenge that the condition poses to the NHS and says that heart failure is still not being diagnosed early enough. The variation in treatment across Wales also highlights the challenges for health professionals. A method of treatment that is used here by us in Splitter Gwynedd is the implantation of a cardiac resynchronization therapy device which is selected for specific patients following careful screening. The British Heart Foundation Cymru has also called for improved ways of detecting, diagnosing and managing heart failure along with more innovative models of care. The need for new innovative methods of care for heart failure has also been further highlighted due to the difficulties encountered during the COVID pandemic. During the lockdown period, many heart failure patients were either advised or took it upon themselves to shield due to the risk of the virus. This in turn had a knock on effect on their quality of life and many were housebound for long periods. Patients also experienced the delay in their care as a result of the constraints put on the health service due to social distancing, staff redeployment and the reduction of face-to-face -face clinic appointments. Research also showed a drop in heart failure hospital admissions across six hospital trusts in England during the first lockdown, with night core data revealing a 66% drop in patients presenting to hospitals with heart failure symptoms in April to May 2020. With these challenges to patient care soon during the pandemic, this really highlighted the benefits of being able to follow up heart failure patients using remote monitoring technology. A feature of Medtronic's remote monitoring system has proven to be very useful during the pandemic is Triage HF+. This allows heart failure patients with cardiac implantable electronic devices to have their heart failure decompensation risk status assessed using physiological and recorded data collected from their device. Those who are identified with a high risk score can then be assessed clinically by the heart failure team and changes to their treatment can be made in order to prevent heart failure decompensation. The patient's heart failure decompensation risk is calculated by identifying risk factors that are present in the patient's implanted device data, which is recorded over the course of 30 days. These risk factors are shown on the bottom left-hand side of the slide and these include the, an increase in optimal level or transthoracic impedance, low patient activity, or the patient having episodes of atrial fibrillation amongst others. The patient's risk score is calculated when the patient's data is sent from the device to the CareLink network. This is done via their home monitor or using a mobile phone app and can occur following a scheduled download a manual download initiated by the patients or a download as a result of a care alert. The data is displayed on the patient's profile on the CareLink home screen with a simple low, medium or high risk score, which is easy to see. Further information can then be reviewed, allowing the physiologist to inspect what risk factors contributed to the risk score and when these changes started to occur. The next stage recommended in the protocol for a high risk patient score involves contacting the heart failure team to inform them of the finding. 
The patient will then be asked a series of questions looking for factors that will suggest that there has been a change in the patient's physiological status. These include, for example, asking for any new or increased breathlessness, new or increased swelling, and any weight gain. Should the heart failure team need to intervene, they now have the clinical information needed to make a decision about the patient's management and can make any necessary changes. The patient is then monitored again in the usual manner using remote monitoring and further assessments can be conducted by the triage HF software at the next download. Patients with low or medium risk scores are monitored with a minimum of one download every three months. The idea of creating a risk score was explored from the results of the Partner HF study. This examined the use of combined heart failure diagnostic information to predict the deterioration of heart failure patients. They classed the patient as having a positive diagnosis for heart failure risk factors if they had an optimal level of more than 100 or two other simultaneous diagnostic criteria, which can be seen on the right hand side of the slide. The findings of the study found that patients who had a positive diagnosis were five and a half times more likely to have a hospital admission due to heart failure decompensation within the next month compared to those who had a negative diagnosis. This clearly highlighted the use of specific factors to identify patients who were at risk of heart failure hospitalization, which became the base on which triage HF was built. One of the other very useful features of triage HF is the ability to create a co-management clinic between physicians and cardiac physiologists and members of the heart failure team who perhaps would not usually review device data on CareLink. Physiologists can specify which patients, what data and which alerts will be shared with the members of the heart failure team to ensure that the information that is relevant to their specific heart failure population is visible. Once co-management is set up, members of the heart failure team can then schedule patient downloads and receive care alerts for their specific patients. This is kept separate from the downloads and care alerts that are present on the other patients followed up on care link by the cardiac physiologists. By using co-management, the aim is to work together in primary and secondary care with the patient's treatment being the main focus of the team. In England, the technology has already been used and in September 2020, Fozia Ahmed and her colleagues from the Manchester hospitals published their data on the use of triage HF and remote monitoring for their patients during the COVID pandemic. One interesting case that was highlighted in the article was that of the patients displayed on the screen. This patient had a device implanted back in 2016 and was enrolled on triage HF in November 2019. The patient's medication at that time are listed on the right hand side of the slide. Once the device had gathered its data and sent a scheduled download to the CareLink network, the patient was identified as having a high risk score. Using the protocol, a heart failure nurse assessed the patient over the phone. Due to the change in the patient's status, Feruzumide was pre prescribed and the patient received that using the service where the medication was delivered to the patient's home. Within less than two weeks, the patient reported an improvement in symptoms during the follow-up consultation. The patient was then scheduled for a follow-up in another month's time to monitor the risk score. Following the analysis of the workload involved with using triage HF, the findings reported on average two phone calls a week of approximately 10 minutes in duration. These calls were incorporated into the time that was used for remote monitoring and follow-up. They also found that for the population of 415 patients who are eligible for triage HF, the weekly workload was approximately 96 minutes a week, which was roughly half an hour per site per week. And finally, for those patients who did present with a high risk score, their management was calculated to needing approximately 32 minutes of, of the work of a band seven heart failure nurse. The team in Manchester concluded that triage HF provided a high tech, low labor, low resource and low cost method of monitoring heart failure patients remotely 
and they concluded that it proved, proved to be particularly useful during the lockdown phase of the pandemic. When the use of triage HF was first implemented, it was done so at Manchester Royal Infirmary, Withenshaw Hospital, Fairfield Hospital and Hammersmith Hospital, seen on the map as the green squares. Since then, the phase one scale up has seen the system used in many more hospitals that you can see highlighted as the yellow dots. It's also listed on the right hand side of the screen. This upscale has resulted in approximately 10,000 patients being enrolled onto Triage HF. In Wales, we're currently unaware of any centres to be using Triage HF protocol at this time. Given the su success from the data collected in England, utilising the technology in hospital in Wales would be a huge step in protecting our heart failure patients from potential decompensation. Given the success of the technology during the pandemic, this would also prove to be beneficial for patients where a face-to-face -face clinic appointment is difficult, as, the, as was seen during the lockdown period. We are still very early in our journey of using Triage HF+, but we have recently started to use it to monitor patients as a joint effort between our primary and secondary care teams at Sputter Gwynedd. Although we are still trying to finalise our operating procedures in order to deliver the most efficient service, we have already started to discover the benefit of having the technology in place. The patient on screen is one who is flagged by the triage protocol as being at high risk of decompensation. The patient triggered a high risk score towards the end of April 2021, which also seems to correlate with an increase in optimal levels. After collecting the data, the information was received on the patient's remote download in June. During that time, we also noticed atrial fibrillation episodes on the patient's device data. The patient was then assessed and, follow up and followed up as recommended in the protocol. The next download from the patient showed that the risk score had dropped from high to medium, suggesting that the risk of decompensation had dropped. By mid-August, the patient's risk score had further dropped to low. This is a great example of the benefit of the technology and it's very easy to follow form. With further time and development, and the upscale of its use in centres across Wales, this technology has the potential to be hugely useful to reduce patient heart failure decompensation and hospitalisations. This can all be done remotely with low labour, low resource and low cost implications. Thank you very much for your time. Diolch That is a fabulous Thank presentation and I am back after having some technology issues. <laughs> So, however, the capabilities of technology absolutely amazes me. And I think that presentation really does highlight the importance of technology and the difference that can make to a person. So that's a fantastic study from Alid Hughes and Hannah Jones. And, you know, I think mobile ultrasound innovation in cardiology diagnostics for rural communities. You know, that's something that really is being brought to the forefront as a result of COVID. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Jenny Townsend, who is the clinical scientist in Betsy Carwalder University Health Board. And I believe, Jenny, you are going to share your presentation live. I will do my best. Bear with me a moment while I get my screen up. Let's just pull this up. Right. Can you see me? We can see you and we can see your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me to the seminar today. Uh, my name is Jenny Townsend and I'm a clinical scientist in audiology and I head up the North Wales Auditory Implant Programme. And I was hoping to tell you very briefly today just about some new ideas that we introduced during the pandemic to support our hearing impaired patients while we were unable to see them face to face. So just to start with a little bit of context about the cochlear implant service. Our service supports adult patients with a severe or profound hearing loss in both ears and a cochlear implant is a device that can very effectively restore some degree of hearing sensation in this group of people. Um, there are two main parts to the implant. There's a surgically implanted part that sits underneath the skin and then an external speech processor that needs to be worn like a hearing aid um, to give the sensation of sound and to help people to understand speech. 
there's quite a detailed assessment process before implantation to make sure that people are suitable and that's followed by a quite intense period of rehabilitation and programming for several months after the surgery to help people get going with it and then followed by lifelong maintenance where we might see people once a year or so um, thereafter. So we are a tertiary level service and we see patients from a, a very large geographical area covering the northern half of Wales and the Mersey Cheshire area of England. And I suppose the defining feature of this group of people is the degree of their deafness. Um, and just for context, only around half of experienced cochlear implant users are able to use the phone effectively even after their implantation. When the pandemic hit, as you'd expect, we had people waiting at various points in their clinical pathways from first referral through to waiting for surgery date or needing maintenance of their device. And the immediate challenge for us was how best we could support this group of people, uh, given that most of them were unable to use the telephone. So for us, using video calls was actually absolutely essential so that we could allow people to lip read and um, also to have live captions to read as well. Our caseload is uh, very biased towards older adults, so we weren't really sure how well they would cope with this change, but we were very pleasantly surprised at how well uh, our caseload accepted using VC in general. We were able to use video calls effectively over lockdown for a range of different appointments, including preoperative um, counselling and risks counselling, postoperative rehabilitation and troubleshooting um, problems with devices. And we were also able to use it to dial in sign language interpreters remotely, which was brilliant because interpreters can be quite hard to access at short notice, especially if your patient prefers to use a particular one. So for the patients who had access to the, the right technology at home, our main problem with VC was um, slightly dodgy broadband, um, especially for our mid powers residents. And it seems the further you live away from the centre, the worse, these, the harder it is to connect. Um, and it was also a challenge to find an NHS approved platform that had decent live captions, and that's still a bit of a work in progress. So the second change that we implemented was really very good timing. Uh, our main manufacturer that we use, Cochlear, had just started a pilot of a new remote care feature called Remote Check. Um, and when the pandemic began, they agreed to open the pilot to all UK centres immediately. So they helped us with all paperwork and we managed to get R&D and information governance approval through in just a few weeks, which I don't think would ever have happened in normal times. Um, the idea of remote check is that if a patient has access to a, a new iPhone or newish iPhone, they can download the remote check app and this allows them to connect to their speech processor and do various checks and tests, which they can then send to us via the app. And these include tests of the implant function, processor function, photographs of their implant site, speech and hearing tests. And there's a questionnaire to identify any other problems they may be having. And they can do that from their living room. And we can then review the results on an online portal and decide how to manage any problems. Or if everything is fine, we might decide we don't need to review them in clinic. We can prompt people to do this at routine intervals or if something happens. For example, if they have an implant, uh, an impact over their implant site, we can test the function of the implant um, and check it's still working properly without them having to come into clinic. What we found is for the people who are able to use it, it's been really, really helpful. And we're hoping it will reduce the need for regular reviews in future for um, uh, patients who aren't having particular problems. But it definitely won't replace face-to-face -face appointments entirely. At the moment, it's restricted mainly to iPhone users. However, Cochlear have just released an update which works on a few Android phones like the Galaxy S20 and some Google Pixel phones. So it's heading in the right direction for accessibility, but it's still not available for um, even the majority of our patients, which is a bit of a shame. So the big gap that we have in remote care now is that at the minute, we still can't change the programming of the devices remotely, so they would need to come into clinic for adjustments. However, a few centres in the UK did manage to do some remote programming over lockdown by um, literally posting a laptop and programming cables to the patient and then doing a remote takeover of the laptop and programming it that way alongside a video call. Um, so it wasn't a particularly elegant solution. However, when we asked the NHS Wales IT service, they point blank refused to let us do that. 
as apparently any sort of uh, remote takeover is very risky from an IT security point of view. So I think we'll have to wait until um, Cochlear work out how to do it through the app, which I know they're working hard on behind the scenes. So another thing we introduced during the lockdown was a lot more postal support. And I guess the new thing here is where we would have brought people into clinic every few years to exchange their processors to their speech process, the latest model. Um, companies started to offer to post them out directly to patients at home, which required us to send them the previous device programming settings. And we would do that by NHS Secure File Share so they could upload them in advance. Um, we found that postal upgrades worked really well for most people and we could just do a VC uh, follow up call to see if they were getting on OK. However, um, recently there is now a cloud based portal called Cochlear Link where the company can pull over the programming data for patients um, without us having to send over individual files. And we're just waiting for um, IGA approval for this. And once we have that, I think that will streamline um, our postal repairs and upgrades considerably. So that's working really well. And finally, we have also had a shot at trying to keep our previously very active patient support groups going. We had um, three different patient support groups meeting every month in various parts of, of Wales and Liverpool. Um, and I think they were, they were very missed during lockdown. We weren't quite sure how it would work given the challenges of getting a group of profoundly deaf elderly people to chat on Teams, but with some very careful organisation and planning, it actually worked really well. And the feedback from patients was very positive. I think they'd all missed the peer support and having access to the live text captions was helpful for many people who, who struggle in a group meeting situation. I don't think there's any real replacement for meeting face to face, but we do plan to keep the e-meetings going as an option for those who find it hard to travel. With us. So given all of that, what does our new normal-ish look like? Um, we're now back to offering face-to-face -face appointments for anyone who wants them, but we do now offer a choice of remote appointments for various appointment types in the pathway. And I guess the most successful of these in terms of patient choice has been um, post-operative rehabilitation by VC, as often these are quite regular appointments and many of our especially working age patients really value being able to save the time and money by doing this remotely. However, it does seem that for most of our pre-operative appointments, people are still choosing to be seen face to face for ease of communication, but at least the choice exists now for those who live and work a long way away. And just to summarise, I, I think we're really surprised at how successful many of our patients were in adopting these new technologies and they should become much more accessible over time. However, we, we need to be mindful that remote care really isn't suitable for everybody and it's going to be very important as we redesign our pathways to ensure that we don't inadvertently introduce a two tier service for those who are digitally literate and those who are not. Um, however, I think the advantages of reducing the barriers in terms of geographical access and offering patient choice really outweigh any downsides considerably. And I think the remote care options for our service will only continue to expand. Thank you very much. Wow, Jenny, some absolutely fantastic solutions there, you know, in response to this pandemic. And I think that, you know, just having choice. You know that's something that we've seen really come to the forefront as a result of COVID-19 is that there are more options available for people now so fantastic work and you know again it's great to read that in detail within the healthcare science innovation chapter and you know we've shone a light today on four fantastic case studies that formulate part of that report you know there are so many more there's actually too many more to fit into kind of you know one session so you know would strongly recommend that you know if you have got the opportunity you know take a look at the NHS Wales COVID-19 innovation and transformation study you know it's been produced through the efforts of a range of partners and um, we've worked really you know collaboratively to deliver a report based on the breadth of local regional and national evidence gathered from across the he um, health and care system in Wales so, you know, with this in mind, the report does provide recommendations for how decision makers and practitioners across NHS Wales can sustain the innovation and transformative ways of working that have emerged. 
So we really hope that you guys do find the study report useful at all levels to affect that positive and meaningful change in practice. So just before I pass you on um, to Dr. Sarah Band, who is the Head of Healthcare Science Transformation in HIW, to say a few closing words, I'd personally like to take this opportunity to thank all our healthcare scientists for their ongoing commitment to the COVID-19 response and for taking the time to contribute to the report. You know, it's a fantastic document and we really do hope that you help us cascade it far and wide. But let's not stop that spotlight being shone on our healthcare scientists you know this is an opportunity to really shout from the rooftops about the fantastic work that you guys are doing and you are really you know changing the lives of people and that is what is so important so for me and the healthcare science program team you know please follow us on twitter you know with our healthcare science cymru um you know sign up to our newsletters and i know sarah's gonna you know echo what i've said here so Thank you, and over to you, Sarah, for some closing words. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Maria, too. And uh, just to add an extra thank you um, to M Maria for her tenacity in bringing all these healthcare science stories together um, to really showcase what we managed to achieve during COVID. I think really uh, Rob Salter summed it up best when he said that we are scientists, so we didn't leave it there. Uh, what a better way is there to sum up the impact of healthcare science and NHS Wales, whether that's our desire to understand the data, as Rob was saying, what that tells us, contribute to the value agenda, or as Chris was saying, making strides in innovation, or as Alid was saying about the fantastic remote monitoring of patients at risk, and the combination of video calls and remote cochlear implant changes that, that Jenny's talked us through as well. And I think again something that uh, Rob alluded to was what might be a simple ask for a healthcare science shouldn't be underestimated for the impact that there can be across the NHS, whether that's AI to enable systems to operate without any user intervention or creating opportunities for wide scale innovation, remote monitoring. I mean, digital care pathways is something that we are uniquely able to, to push forward the agenda on. Um, and the way that we can meet usually technologically challenging patient <laughs> needs that require a lot of equipment in a clinic directly in their homes. So we're clearly forging ahead. And I, I recognise that COVID did give a specific need for this rapid test and adoption, but just want to add our commitment in the healthcare science programme that we do want to make sure that those opportunities for innovation aren't lost moving forwards. We are going to pick this topic up again in our conference, which is planned for February 2022. Um, but for more details on, on anything that's been developed um, and to keep in touch on healthcare science across Wales, um, as uh, Maria was saying, um, do go to our website, sign up for the newsletter. Um, if you're watching the recording of this, there will be information um, that has been shared in the chat will be posted below so that you'll still be able to access those links. Um, the innovation report links are on our website as, as well. Thank you so much for all our presenters today and for all of you who've taken the time to attend and we hope to see you soon at future events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.